first of all, what on how delighted, <laughs> how delightful this is to have this many people. I think we had what two or three people last time. Yeah. And, um, uh, uh, Senator White sends her greetings, and Senator Clarkson uh, sends her greetings. I'll be here for the for your Senate delegation on account of I live in Bethel. And um, I, to get started, I think I, I got some criticism for an earlier meeting that uh, the legislators talked too much, and that people came they wanted to speak as well as to listen. And so we're going to leave. I've always been suspicious when a politician says, well, I, I came to listen, not to speak. I think, gee, I guess he didn't prepare. Huh? But uh, in this case. Um, and clearly and no I should continue my usual presentation. So thank you. In any case, let's let's talk about the, the big issues right now. Um, uh, before the, the Senate, and of course we have two separate houses. Uh, and it, it, we really are more separate than the public realizes. We do not talk to each other a lot. And that's on purpose. That's by design. The Senate is supposed to make its decisions. The House makes its decisions so that you have two discrete bodies thinking independently. Oh, is Allison here? Oh, great. I thought you. Great. Senator Clarkson it's is here. It's only 7.40. Yes. <laughs> what? We the calls. I got behind a very law by no, I know. We put, we put, <laughs> oh, I know. Look, this is great. Yeah, this Last is great. We had four of us or five of us. Yeah. So I had just I was just starting Allison Allison Hi. Good Allison morning, a chair. Everybody. And I, I got the big soft chair, Allison. That's okay. I won't say anything. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, the big issues that we are we have folk chosen to focus on. Of course, every bill that's introduced gets some consideration in committee, at least the question, do we want to take this up? Sometimes the answer is no, and it stays on the, on the board. But um, every bill gets at least looked at. Um, we are a citizen legislature. We do not have the time or the people to give thorough examination to every proposal. So a lot of often the decision is that's going to have to wait for another year. We've got other things to do this year. What we are focused on um, right now, and then, and then the bills go to committees, and the committees tend to focus on their own work at this point in the, in the legislative session. At a certain point, the committees are done with their work and uh, vote a bill out or not. Often there's not voted out with recommended amendments. And then it comes to the floor. And then every senator looks at, ev at every issue that that's voted to the floor. Right now, we're in committees. I serve on natural resources and energy in the morning and finance in the afternoon, which uh, touches on pretty much everything, because it's, it's about the revenues of the state. So it's the tax committee, but also any, any bill that's going to require state funding. The Appropriations Committee decides whether or not how much money to give it, but the money's got to come from somewhere, and the Finance Committee uh, looks at that. We also have jurisdiction over utilities and over financial regulation, so it's a very busy committee. Natural Resources and Energy, as the title indicates, deals with natural resources and energy, and this year the, the issue being global warming and uh, a cleaner fuel, well, the, the energy is a natural resources issue, and, and we're dealing in particular, the, the low number of the bill says something, S5, which is the work of the chair of the committee, uh, Senator Bray, with several co-sponsors of which I am one. And that is a bill to establish a, um, a program for shifting off of um, fossil fuels, which are global warming fuels. I think the what was a scientific debate about global warming 30 years ago really has been resolved. And at this point, when people say they have doubts about global warming, They've really left the discussion at that point. Uh, the discussion now is, is what, are, what are we going to do about it? And uh, this is a, a program that, that uh, distributes basically wholesalers <laughs> of fossil fuels, global warming fuels, um, developed with the Public Utilities Commission, we'll actually structure it, 
will participate in a program in which they can earn credits for efforts, for activities to shift their customers off of fossil fuels uh, because of um, uh, increased weatherization, increased conservation, and that comes first in a pecking order. Whether is it con conservation and weatherization mm -hmm. remains number one. But then also we have to burn, we have to use some kind of fuel. We want to heat our houses. This, and the S5 is, is entitled the affordable heat bill. It is a way to get people off the at very expensive uh, fossil fuels. I, it's amazing to me. I get emails sometimes say, well, how are we going to afford this? And of course my answer is, how, how are we going to afford your plan? And the person says, well, I don't have a plan. I say, yes, you do. No plan is a plan. If you have no plan, then your plan is continuing things as they are. And we can't afford that. And it's amazing. People will tell me how much their petroleum costs. And you're going to make it more expensive. Well, you don't need me to do that. It's, it's volatile. Petroleum prices, fossil fuel prices are extremely unpredictable and always high and always higher than the clean heat. Always much higher. Clean energy is the least expensive to operate. It's expensive to, to get into. And that's what S5 is aiming at, is making it easier for people to, to get into the less uh, uh, destructive uh, energy. Pretty much anything we do has some problems. And um, I was just emailing my son early this morning, who's very indignant about the what is essentially slave labor in Africa to get cobalt for the batteries. I mean, this is no small thing. But I do not, I do not go with the logic that says, you have a problem, you have a solution. Oh, there's a problem with the solution. Well, therefore, there's no problem. I don't buy that. <laughs> I think we, we have a problem. It's global warming. We have a solution. There are problems with the solutions. And that's what we've got to continue to, to work on. OK, I don't want to talk too much. I'll hand it off. Well, uh, why don't we let the other senator go? No, no, you're not. <laughs> you're so deferential. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't know if you you're next in your local. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. fine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've gotten into the habit. For the record, Kirk White. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, it is a record. Yes, there is the record. So, because uh, in all the committees, when the testimony, you know, there's a big sign on the desk and it says, state your name. Uh, so, uh, for the record. So, um, I am in the House, uh, in case for those who don't know, and uh, the House operates differently than the Senate, um, and uh, uh, we only have one committee that we're appointed to, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm on the Committee for Commerce and Economic Development, which was the committee I was on my first session last, last time. Um, and I like to say that uh, it is it, you know, there are some committees that can be pretty contentious. People have different, you know, different views, and, and uh, but but you know, it, my committee does either really boring things like uh, you know, regulating insurance, uh, or we do uh, things like let's get more money to your town so it can be more prosperous. And so, to to a certain extent, no one usually has anything to complain about that. Oh, oh gee, we gave our town some more money. Uh, I hate that. Uh, so, uh, so it's a good committee. I mean, we have a good mix of, of people. We, um, you know, you may know there was a big turnover in the legislature this time, and so uh, our committee of eleven has uh, uh, six new members, and uh, so there's a, uh, a learning curve and training up the, the new folks. Um, you know, the the house as a whole. So, so just to, you know, if, if you, somebody comes up with a bill, bill proposal, right, and it gets um, uh, the Speaker of the House assigns it to the, the Committee of Jurisdiction. They, they send it to the committee that's going to work on it, maybe. And, and it does what they call, it goes on the wall. And it literally is a, a cork board, and they print out little copies of it, of, you know, the name and the number, and it goes on the wall. And then what they'll say is whether or not it's taken off the wall, and that's whether or not you actually 
kind of take it and work on it. And I, I don't know. You said that uh, you know the uh, committee as a whole decides on your on your bills wh which ones get worked on. Uh, theoretically, it's the the chair's yeah. choice, yeah. but it, certainly whenever I've chaired a committee, I have yeah. made sure that I was in league with my committee. It, I didn't. In the House, because we have, you know, we have more people. I mean, one committee is, is you know, my committee of eleven is, you know, a third of the size of the Senate, right? Um, it, all those decisions are basically the chair, maybe the chair, the vice chair. So, so they just they pick it, and if if you uh, if you're, if you're uh, not the chair, then you you work on the chair's part of it. So, uh, and uh, so. Um, you're stepping on your glasses. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I knew they'd So uh, the House as a whole has has really been uh, so that so then your a uh, little background still. So then your committee works on the bill and if they can come up with a agreement on it and often the, the bills change quite a lot in that process and if they uh, can come to something they agree, then that gets they pass that and then that gets sent to the, the floor as a whole and, and then you know, it gets presented there, and people interrogate and ask questions and clarify, and and, uh, and then if then it either gets voted down or it prevails one or the other. Uh, in which case, it comes, uh, you know, it, it's passed by our body and then gets passed over to the Senate. Uh, and uh, so, and just to remind people, there is a thing that's called crossover, and. Uh, it's what the 17th of March this year, 18th, for, something like that. Non yeah, but it has to. Yeah, and so uh, uh, all the from one body, you have to have passed the bills you're going to pass. So by then, so that they can go over to the other body for them to work on. So if you miss that crossover deadline, you're basically your bills done for for that year. Uh, you know, there are occasional times I think when, when there's a piece of something where, where a committee can say, "Well, I know that we didn't take that up." Sometimes I think it's strategic. They're like, "We didn't take that up because we're going to stick it in later." Uh, but uh, and so, uh, so that kind of works out that way. So anyway, the House uh, as a whole has uh, really we spent the first uh, couple weeks. Uh, we spent the first well, we spent until. February 3rd, uh, working on the Budget Adjustment Act, and that's uh, you know every two years, right? You know, well every year, right? You set a budget, and and then uh, halfway through the year, you look at the budget and say, you know, uh, you know, how's that? How's what we predicted compared to what's actually happening? And so maybe this this project isn't costing as much as we thought. But that one's costing more, so can we shift some of that over and you know, make that work? So the budget adjustment, and that has been the, the biggest focus of pretty much all the committees, you know, for the month of January. Uh, there, are some of them have been working on a few other things, but that was really a big one. <coughs> the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the bills that have come out of the House, for the most part, with one exception, which we'll get to, uh, has been things like. Uh, uh, the process to which burning permits are are submitted, uh, you know, uh, try to to more standardize that that the, that, the, that when the state fire warden you know sort of lets the, the local fire wardens know whether or not you know it's a good time to issue fire permits and stuff like that, uh, burning permits, uh, and then things like uh, the Colchester Fire District doesn't want to exist anymore, so. But the way the law is written, you know, they have to be created or, or uncreated by, by the legislature, things like that. Uh, but the, the big one is uh, uh, House Bill 89, which we just passed last week, and that's um, um, the shield bill. The shield bill. And, uh, and so that's, that's the bill that uh, basically, you know, with, with uh, you know, the tearing down of, of uh, Roe versus Wade, um, you know, now we're, everyone is subject to each other's interstate laws, right? You know, in Texas it was, right, that made the, made the, the law that, that, that someone in Texas can sue you in Vermont if you help someone get an abortion or, or whatever. 
And so, uh, so it's created kind of this, this uh, uh, legal, really, who knows, right? You know, it's a wild west. Everybody can sort of sue each other for whatever back and across state lines and stuff. So the shield bill basically uh, is, is there to protect Vermonters, Vermont health care providers and others uh, in uh, basically saying that, that, you, that if they sue a Vermonter, that Vermont is not going to participate in it. We're not going to extradite people from Vermont to Texas, you know, to to do those kind of things. And and it even has some provisions in there that allow Vermonters to, if someone in Texas sues you for ten thousand dollars because your niece from Texas came to Vermont and she and she got an abortion when she was here, but she stayed at your house, so therefore you're an accessory. Uh, uh, and so. Someone in Texas wants to sue you for ten thousand dollars. There's a provision there that says that uh, uh, Vermont gives you the right to sue the person who sued you for the ten thousand dollars plus expenses. Uh, so uh, yeah, so there's there's pieces like that in there. Uh, but that that was that was one of the big pieces that came out of the the legislature as a whole so far. Uh, there are some other ones, uh, including. Uh, a bill that there are people who, when they, uh, you know, they get a divorce or they were a couple and they break up or something like that, and one partner just basically makes the others hell because they've got enough money that they can afford to just keep suing them for everything. Uh, and so, uh, so it's abusive litigation. It doesn't matter. They just sue you for this, and then you, say, you, know, you get that written off. They sue you for that, and you just keep it going. Uh, and so, so we've uh, also passed a bill to, to make that not okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the House as a whole. Uh, my committee uh, has been working on a. Sorry, just on the Shield Bill. Yeah. My understanding is the Shield Bill also protects. If we're concerned about protecting our own providers, but we're also <clears throat> concerned about pr protecting people who come here for care. Yeah. Um, whether it's a man getting a vasectomy or whether it's a, 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 a woman getting, getting an abortion. But it's, it, my understanding is it's designed to protect those coming here as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my own committee has been working on a few different things. Uh, we have been, uh, and you know, like remember, this is commerce and economic development, so some of it is wicked exciting. Uh, <laughs> it's all exciting. <laughs> uh, but uh, one thing we're working on is uh, what's called earned wage access services. And until a few months ago, I had never heard of this. And now I've had the chair of my committee, actually. And what it is is, is there are companies out there have been providing this service for 10 years, uh, unregulated. and. Uh, basically, they contract with either you or your employer. And let's say you get paid every two weeks. But you have bills that are due that you want to pay in those in between. So you can actually, they will give you, based on the money you've already earned, the, the hours you've already, they will give you, a, you know, a, a, you know a, they'll give you that money. Mm -hmm. And then at the, after you get paid, it comes back out of either your account or your or your employer it goes that way um, and so it's not quite like a payday loan uh, and and the earned wage access companies are they do that they have that basic service for free uh, they have all sorts of other like so if you do it the free one you'll get the money in two or three days if you want the money today it's going to cost you three percent uh, they also, um, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of kind of you know little details in that around how that works, and 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 like I said, there's some that do it directly out of your account. There's some that contract with with your employer, and there are a number of big employers that actually do this now. But there's also one you can just download the app on your phone and hook it up to your bank account, and. Where we have real questions there is, is so this company now has access to every transaction you ever did. Uh, and uh, they have your entire 
financial history of, of what you bought, uh, you know, uh, you know the, through because it ties right into your bank. Uh, so we're trying to create, uh, you know, so what we call guardrails. Uh, that was one of those phrases when I became a legislator. I was like, oh, guardrails. You know, <laughs> everyone's talking about guardrails. I'm like, well, what is this? Uh, but uh, uh, guardrails and restrictions around that. And the industry themselves want to be regulated uh, uh, because I think they're afraid of their own, that some, right now, it's a small number of companies and they've worked hard to, to put together processes and be res respectful and distinguish themselves from payday lenders. Uh, uh, and so really trying to establish themselves as legit. And I think they're afraid that somebody's going to show up one day with an app and, and make it look bad. And uh, so they, they want to be regulated, and so we're just trying to figure out the best way to do that. Uh, we, we will probably vote that bill out this week. We'll, we'll finally have completed that. Um, another thing we've been working on is there's a organization, uh, the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive Program, VEGI, they call it. And, uh, uh, and basically, it's a, a program that it's as it's called, it's growth incentive program. And so what happens is is you've got a company and you want to grow and be able to hire new employees, uh, but you don't feel like at this that you know you don't know if you can do a sustained enough growth over X period of time to that that the money you're going to make, right? You're kind of in this bind. If I get, I hire some new employees, but then there's going to be, you know, and I'll have them for a year, but then I don't know, you know, if the work that they're going to give me is going to make it compensate enough that I can then afford to get more employees and, and grow the way I want to. Uh, or also, I don't know if I can make the, the capital investments in my property in order to, I, I need to expand my, um, uh, my facilities, like um, Lawson's uh, beers, uh, uh, hit a place where they they just didn't have enough room, and they needed to invest in in expanding. And they were pretty certain that if they could expand, then they would be able to go from the three employees they had to 50 or more. So you can go to the Veggie program, and um, and you can. Uh, go through an exhaustive amount of, of, of uh, applications that we, we looked at them. And if you're approved, basically what they do is they give you a, uh, every, at the end of every year, they, you, you set goals. You say, okay, by the end of, the, I'm going to do this for four years. By the end of the first year, I will have hired seven new people. At the end of the next year, I will have hired 10 more people. I didn't have to pick up, right? And if you hit that goal, and they can tell through the tax department who you're paying taxes on, uh, if you hit that goal, then you actually get some of the money that you paid in back. Uh, so you're, you're sort of compensated for growing, for growing your business and making, getting, getting more people working. And it's a really, <coughs> um, and then, the best example locally is GW Plastics. GW Plastics, GW Plastics has taken advantage of this. Uh, and, but, so it's due to sunset at the end of this year. And so we're, we're reworking it, we're looking at it. There are some issues that people in my committee have with it in that, in a way, it's a black box. Uh, there's a, there's a, it's over, you know, it's got a director. Uh, actually, uh, Abby Sherman, uh, our former assistant town manager, uh, is, the, is the director of it. And then, um, and then it is, uh, there's a, what's it, a board that, that sort of makes the decisions, an appointed board that makes the decisions on those with, uh, through and with her. And the way they've got it set up, because they're afraid that that if they tell people that you know, these companies are giving you their financial information and if they share too much back that these companies won't want to do it because proprietary information. 
but some of us have been making the argument, if I'm going to give you $5 million, I need you to tell me a thing or two about, like, what you did, other than you, like, maybe who you paid all that money to, and, you know, how that worked. But right now, it's a black box. You get no information. Uh, uh, that they, they don't tell you. Uh, it, yeah, it's not public knowledge how many people have, have done, you know, we're hot, you know, we know how many people hire, tax department says, but you don't, but they don't tell you who gets paid what, what wages. They're supposed to guarantee that these are wages that are 140% higher than the minimum wage, uh, at, at the least. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, a number of other kinds of things, but basically they share no information. So part, part of what we're trying to do is to say, we, we need some accountability. Uh, also, the program is, because it's a black box, they don't let the auditor, the state auditor, or, uh, or the uh, house economists uh, look at their books. Right? And that just all sounds really bad to me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I feel like you're handing out millions of dollars, there needs to be some kind of accountability. Right? Uh, how do we know it's really a good use of our tax money? And so um, uh, the uh, so we've been both listening. Oh, and the other piece of it is is <coughs> there are some pieces of it that uh, for certain industries get a little extra money, uh, like green industries and uh, mm -hmm. and other certain. Uh, the things that they identify we need more of right now. Uh, in and, areas where we need in it. In areas where we need it. And, and then there's also, um, yeah, this, this, and, and there's always the question of, do we need to create more jobs at the moment? So uh, the bill we've got that we're working through, one of them, the pieces is to say, when, when you are a place like we are right now, where we have many more jobs and we have people to fill them, do we need a company, or do we need to pay a company to create more jobs? And are they actually going to be bringing those in from outside, or are we just shuffling the pieces on the board? Hmm. You know, we're just paying one company to, to pill for someone else's employees. Uh, and so uh, there's that question that's, that's being raised. The other question is that whole accountability piece. Uh, and so we're trying to put through, uh, at least the chair is, uh, part of his, his vision is, is to allow the auditor and the uh, economists and the joint fiscal office to be able to, to see the, the books, to really see the books. They're already sworn to, to, to confidentiality because they look at everybody's books. Uh, so to allow some more accountability there, uh, and, and to actually ask these companies to allow certain pieces of information to become more public. We heard testimony this last week from Beta Technologies, the electric plane company. We heard from Lawson's fine, Finest Liquids or whatever, their company, something like that, the beer company. Uh, we heard from, um, I'm trying to remember who else, we heard from four, four different uh, companies. And we had heard testimony from the state who said, no, you cannot, you cannot share that information. These companies will hate that. And then all these companies came and said, no, we have a problem with that. Uh, you know, yeah, you're giving us money. You know, we, should, we should be able to tell you, you know, this stuff. And so, uh, so we'll see where this goes. Uh, there's also a piece of it that um, right now the pro program is it's officially it's the veggie board that has, you know, uh, the, the, but it's and it officially it do, it's it's highly partnered with the agency of commerce and community development uh, and really actually if you listen to testimony they come in they give all the testimony Abby gives almost no testimony uh, uh, they come in they give all the testimony they're the ones who are promoting it uh, they're the ones who they're for uh, for a while their attorney was the person who was doing it. so again it's this closed box and no one could see. It. So part of what we're talking about is, is breaking some of that out so that they are, you know, maybe they're under the Department of Financial Regulations, you know, and so that the Agency of Commerce and Community Development can promote the thing, but not then also be the person who runs the thing and is accountable to the thing, right? You know, if you're on, if you're on best cheerleader, there's a temptation to, 
not want to tell people when things aren't going as well as you wished it was. So, so there's a whole piece around that that, that, that our committee is working on. Uh, Can I bring up something that you're supposedly, since you're on, on, on the floor right now? Yeah. Um, this is... Um, Sorry, what's your name? I'm Ellie Griffin. I've met you. Oh, sorry. Ellie Griffin. Yeah. Yeah. Ellie Griffin. Yeah. 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 Ellie Griffin. Well, she does. Yes. <laughs> well, in the paper, it yeah. says the House is working on issues of domestic violence. They are. Yes. Yes. And right here in Bethel, we have a domestic violence case. Well, you yeah. probably have several. Yeah. Don't yeah. Like yes. that one. I think that we have several. And I know it's hard for um, people involved in the domestic violence case, um, especially if you're the victim. Deb here is the victim. And, um, and I, I feel that with Bethel for All, that, that, that it should be brought out um, for people in Bethel to know and to have this, the story or information from the victim's side. Um, I, I know it's hard for Deb as a victim. I can't relate. I've never been abused. And, um, and I, I, I just um, feel that, that um, Bethel is not listening and not willing to listen to, to the situation and to what the, and I know it's really hard for Deb to be here as a victim because no one in Bethel, except for her neighbors, are listening and supporting Deb. Everybody else is sweeping it under the table. And um, I'm sorry to say, I know that it, the other member of this case is here too. The other member of the case is running for select board. And um, so, LA, that that is a legal. I mean, we are not allowed. I'm Allison Clarkson, yeah. one of your senators. I mean, that's uh, a, a challenge <clears throat> because yeah. that is probably a legal case, and we aren't able to step into that. That is, oh. uh, we are working on issues of domestic violence. We should okay. not speak personally here, I don't think, right. and mm -hmm. uh, on issues of domestic violence, one of our top, I mean, we address this, we're looking at this with firearm safety, okay. uh, with, uh, in, there's a, the health care committee in the house is taking up um, uh, suicide prevention and domestic violence in their health care bill that okay. is the firearm safety bill that's coming through the house okay. uh, that will be taking up safe storage because okay. we know that 50% of our homicides by firearm are done in domestic violence cases. So okay. we have lots of uh, domestic violence concerns. And you may remember the t terrible tragedy in South Royalton with a man who got out of prison and, in a domestic right. violence case right. and killed his, right. ex, his wife. Right. The, I, I think we, in these kind of forms, we can't speak personally. Oh, okay. and, and you should know that domestic violence is, is a top priority yeah. in, in, in the legislature and has been oh, for okay. several years. We <clears throat> figure out different ways we hope we can be helping, oh, helping it, but we're right. very Yeah, because I read aware. it and I, and I just want to make sure that it's yeah. not, well, I ran a child care center in South Royalton for, from 1978 to 1992 and I had three domestic violent cases that I had to deal with but they they involved children so I know you know I and you were in that case a mandatory a reporter, reporter too yes so, right so, so yeah. yeah but you should know that it's a priority and something we're okay. absolutely continuing so to I work just, on I, okay. I just um, wanted to thank bring, you for raising and may you know make sure that that we're all on the same page yeah thank you so, yeah what oh no and, and so those are the main things there's a few other exciting things we've got so we're talking about unemployment insurance we always talk about unemployment insurance uh and, and you know the the status of the trust fund and you know so 
So, but that's those are the big things my committee's been working on. I don't want to take up all the time. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm still a baby legislator, so I'm so excited when I can tell you what we're doing. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to Allison. She can move on to the next piece here. Hi, everybody, and people in the corner. Allison Clarkson. I'm your other uh, one of the three state senators lucky enough to represent Windsor County District and Bethel. And Becca, did you already say that Becca is agree. Becca's special day off? And so, I mean, this is one of our challenges is that Monday is the day we, it's either off or on. And it's generally on. It's generally working in our communities. Um, I serve uh, as the majority leader in the Senate. <clears throat> I also serve as vice chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, and as uh, on government operations. And we are in the Senate, as Dick has noted, we're, we're working on our top priorities. Our top priorities are housing, workforce development. So we serve on complementary committees. Uh, and um, so housing is one of our top priorities. I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, family care, uh, reproductive, uh, so further protecting reproductive liberty, which Kirk, Kirk has already mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but also paid family leave and child care, other big priorities of this session. And, um, and of course, uh, health care in, in a variety of ways. Uh, in the, <clears throat> I think we've talked a lot. Of, we've already, we're already, we only, I don't know whether we go to 8.30 or 9, but nice. I think we should open it up. I'm working uh, in economic development, really working on a huge housing bill that is if you look at it in a big picture, it's really designed at breaking down the barriers <coughs> to development. We've poured money into housing, into new housing, and 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 low-hanging fruit of um, of taking vacant and blighted properties and bringing them back online and developing ADUs. So we've we've poured a lot of money in the last two years, over four hundred million dollars. It, it, we've never had that much money to put into housing, but we've been underbuilding new housing in Vermont since the 80s, and we're not going to fix this overnight. The, the, you know, it's been exacerbated by COVID and by, uh, by a, the, a number of refugees moving here and by the development of, of Airbnbs, which have taken away a ton of our long-term housing. Anyway, the point is we're working on this big bill to address some um, by right uh, opportunities. We have uh, 80 <coughs> accessory dwelling units by right. We're looking at zoning. We're looking at maybe doing duplexes by right. We're looking at um, uh, some uh, speeding up of permitting. So we're looking at zoning, permitting, uh, reducing the number of appeals uh, in downtowns and village centers and places served by water and sewer. So we're really trying to develop and, and our, our housing and, and promote our housing in our village centers, if, uh, especially if they're served by water and sewer, and um, to, to do smart growth and to protect, further protect our, our back country and really incent uh, housing in our downtown and village centers. <clears throat> that's the, that's the, the, the primary push that's going on in economic mm -hmm. development in the Senate. Uh, we have a lot of other bills. The House is going to start the work on the workforce bill, which I'm working on with uh, your vice chair, and we're working hard on that. In, econ in Senate uh, GovOps, we're working on a, a trying to get dispatch. Dispatch is a mess and is, been a, is a real patchwork, and we're trying to do a, a get dispatch better organized. We're looking at uh, the sheriff there uh, at um, <laughs> some work on, on qualification qualifications of, of sheriffs and law enforcement, and we're also looking at the rank, rank choice voting and whether we might consider as a state mm -hmm. moving <clears throat> at least one of our elections, uh, maybe the presidential primary, to rank choice voting, mm -hmm. which is uh, in many ways uh, uh, the sort of next step in, in making our elections a little more democratic uh, with a look. Um, so th those are some of the things, but we've been talking, it would be great to hear your questions. I mean, Ellie had a question and I know there are other questions. So we're happy to, I think we're all happy to answer questions and talk about process. Um, my job as, as majority leader is to really <coughs> help develop a community in my, in my caucus, in the Senate Democratic Caucus. So <clears throat> I do a lot of that work and um, I don't know. Any, by, uh, <laughs> any questions you have for us, we'd love to answer. 
Not really. <laughs> Dick, on your left. Oh, gee. You mentioned ranked choice voting. Uh, there is another option that I think is much simpler, and it's multiple choice voting, where you simply you take a list, you look at all the candidates, you vote for those that you would support. At the end of the day, the person with the most votes wins. Hmm. It's, it, you don't change the ballots except to say you can vote for all the people that you want. Uh, That's sort of ranked choice voting. No, it's not a preference. It's a preference. Okay. It's not a uh, preference. It's, you're not ranking people. You're simply saying, I would, there are seven people running for this office. I would vote for the three of you. You each get a vote. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the person with the most votes wins. It, it changes one thing on the ballot, and that is vote for the number of people, vote for people that you would support. So if you are in a minority party, you, can, you don't have to play games <laughs> about trying to figure mm -hmm. out who you're going to take the vote from or in the ranked choice. You simply vote for your, your favorite and, and any other people that you would mm -hmm. choose who could be. It's much simpler, easier to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't change anything when I go into the booth. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Gene, that's a, <clears throat> to me a new a new idea, and I'll reserve judgment. I'll but think I'll, about I'll, it. I'll I'll right send yeah. some information. People, people who don't know what ranked choice voting is, it's a um, in ranked choice voting you you list your for number one preference, your number two preference, your number three preference. Preference. If somebody gets the majority, I'll just get as an example. If somebody gets the majority of number one preferences, the election's over. That person won a majority and has been elected. If nobody has a majority, you then start looking at the number two choices. Right. And, and 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 there are various ways of doing <clears throat> it. In some models, you, the 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 person who came in last drop it drops out, and it just you look at that person's number two. Uh, it it. I can tell you, having run in many elections and having voted, in 1968, you know, I was uh, angry at uh, Lyndon Johnson and his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, over the war in Vietnam, and I refused to vote for Hubert Humphrey. So I voted for Benjamin Spock, <laughs> which, meant, which means <clears throat> I kept my conscience clear, but I was totally useless, and I helped elect Richard Nixon. Right. Okay, so this gives you the, what, if it was right choice, I would have had Benjamin Spock, number two choice, Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. You see, and when Benjamin Spock got all of 15 votes or something, then, <laughs> then they would have, have taken up his number two choices, and that would have gone to Humphrey. Well, and in a presidential primary, this is important uh, for a number of reasons. We Vermonters have embraced early voting so enthusiastically. The challenge is, as we all know, you could vote by mail six weeks before the election in early March. Mm -hmm. And you, we all know that between January and early March, a number of people pull out. So you may have put all your eggs in that basket. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth choice, um, your vote isn't lost. Uh, and it would be tallied for the people who are remaining. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of, of really having your voice heard in a way that just simply voting for uh, mm -hmm. one person doesn't, uh, especially if that person drops out. Also, the other big plus of ranked choice, choice voting, uh, whether however we, you do it, because there are actually several models of how to do it, um, is that it reduces rancor in elections. And I think this is one yeah. of the things that resonates for all of us as we look at the ugliness that has, has evolved and that's, that's cropped up in the last several years uh, in elections. Um, and uh, it, Because no one can afford to be super nasty uh, because you want to be their second choice or their third choice. You, want still, you still want people choosing you. Mm -hmm. And they, you may not be their first choice, but you might be their second or third choice. So 
no one can afford to be uh, to alienate people. You really want to be heard, and you want to have people understand what you stand for, and you really want to be listed as their first, second, or third choice. So I think I think those are some of the reasons that people are are enthusiastic about ranked choice voting. Uh, in, uh, in what what it does is it lets people vote their conscience without wasting a vote. That's really what it is. Great point. I'd like everybody up in Montpelier to vote their conscience and not worry about the fact that the other senators, I don't like you to vote for gun control. I want to vote for it. That's my conscience. I'm going to do it. If I don't get elected next time, so be it. I voted the way I feel. So, but I got a lot more questions okay. if we have time. Go for it, Dave. S5. Uh, read S5 and S6 pretty carefully several times, and I'm concerned about both of them. S5, which is the, the clean, of, well, that's what it's called, but it has nothing to do with affordability, uh, because if you, what I consider you've done is you what you're trying to do, you get the, health, the horse in front of the cart. There's electric this, electric that, electric, all these electric things you're going to do, but what I say to my electric people that want me to believe in electricity because I'm an electrician, I want everybody to have an electric car. I want everybody to have an electric pump. I want, I want, because you know what's going to happen? This state will shut down almost instantly. We do not have the infrastructure to give everybody an electric car, to everybody have an electric heat pump, to have an electric water heater, electric, electric heaters. We do not have the infrastructure for that. But okay, so let's, instead of putting out a million dollars for new people to run this, it was $800 for two people and another $200 million for another two people, uh, 200000 So it's a million dollars that you guys are planning on in this bill in additional money that we got to come up with to run this affordable heat act. It, we're not putting any money into uh, utilities to increase our capability to provide this service to everyone. It's a big deal, as far as I'm concerned. It's a huge deal. Um, the other thing that I caught, got in there was uh, advanced wood heating is part of the thing that the, the suppliers can do. Is yeah. There are only 10 or 12 things that they're uh, asked to do. There's no definition in the in the law in the bill anywhere that what what is advanced wood heating. There's nothing in there. I read it several times. There's nothing about is what. Is that not in the definition? It, it, no, it, no, it's it's it probably should be. You're right. Yeah, it's there sure. is a definition. I mean, it's, we it's know not. It's not in S5. No, we know what we're discussing there. That that's. Uh, I'll I'll take that up tomorrow because it should be in the definition section. And then we talk about credits yeah. in this bill. You talk about credits for the um, suppliers or the wholesalers or, you know, I don't know what level that's going to work at, but there's no, there's nothing, no way you talk about penalties. Well, these credits, if not met, create a penalty to the use and me's in here because we can't afford to put up solar power or, or whatever it takes to get into clean heat. Well, so the penalty will be, okay, I have to keep buying oil. Now my supplier, because he doesn't, he's got to have oil for me and a lot of other folks, he doesn't have the credits. So that means there's, there's a penalty clause which will drive up the cost of fuel. And I understand the theory, okay, we get the cost so it's prohibitive, then you will buy electric. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that's a really, um, I don't think you should do that to everybody, is to say, we're going to drive you through your wallet to electric. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have to do that. They're being driven by their, through their wallet by the um, petroleum industry, by the fossil yeah. fuels industry. Um, the, the, the expense of dirty energy is something that people can't afford. And, and, and the, the, this, is, this is not coercive. The bill is intended to help people make the transition. 
Uh, and as, as far as, as your comment about the infrastructure being ready, um, much to the frustration of global warming activists, uh, the target date here, uh, we have several, no, it's not target because it's already, now it's law, it's not goals, it's legal requirements. Uh, 2030 is where Some certain department. things have to have. Yeah, but the thing, and then the, the real goal is, is 2050, and I've said, well, I can make all sorts of promises about that because I'm not going to be here unless I live to 103. But uh, the well, some people do. Uh, they're usually not heavy. Uh, the uh, we have testimony that the infrastructure, the electrical infrastructure, will be there when when it, when it's needed. Uh, but the um, and what what was your you made another point you made about the definitions, and I, I think that, that should, oh yeah the the, the uh, biofuels. We are getting a lot of pressure from environmentalists not to include biofuels uh, because it's you know it's not a good source of energy. It's a not as horrible <laughs> source of energy. You know, less bad. Uh, but we, we're also getting we're getting testimony. Right? Yeah, we're getting testimony that um, uh, it really can't be done without biofuels. That if you're looking at just electricity and conservation, uh, the fact is in Vermont, even if we use uh, heat pumps, for example, people say to me, well, heat pumps won't work in Vermont. They do work. In fact, they, they, they do. do. Yeah, yeah, they work. I, I, but, but they don't work adequately when it's 40 below. People are going to want some kind of backup. And uh, and the argument then is made, it's because there are really three positions here. The people who are saying that we shouldn't be doing this at all, stick with the, with, the, with, with the dirty fuels. And then there are people who are saying, well, don't use any biofuels. Uh, the argument is made by, I think that what's emerging as the prevailing argument is the only thing that will actually work includes biofuels. And you know the old adage, never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In this case, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the not quite so horrible. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the thing is, is that the, the program would not be focused on biofuels. Twenty years ago, we, we pledged as a state to limit ourselves to renewables, and we counted Hydro-Quebec as a renewable, which is an, an environmentally problematic source. And, uh, you know, but don't you think, Dick, it's fair to say there is no energy source that doesn't have a problem? Yeah, I mean, I mean cobalt mining with what appears to be child slave labor in the Republic of Congo. I mean, that's, just, that's no small thing. I mean, just, the, yeah. just the amount of fires that were during this last coal sap in the country of lithium-ion batteries in electric cars, I would hope that would scare somebody because those fires are not a little campfire. Those are serious yeah. fires. I mean, they had they the airline industry had they do have provisions now, so you can take your little lithium batteries with you on the plane, provided in a protective carrier and whatnot. But they had previously banned all lithium ion batteries on airplanes because of fires. Mm -hmm. So and lithium, you don't go with an electric prod and right out of the ground, you go get this huge diesel or whatever powered loader to move it out of the ground and process it on a big diesel truck to a big diesel processing place to get the lithium so you can put it in your electric battery. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like people to talk about those things. They talk about electric, electric's great, electric, electric. Well, how did you get that electric? Yeah. How did you get that electric? Well, no, I don't think anyone is ignoring that. that and batteries. Question, David. Batteries are a storage unit. They're not electricity. Right. Batteries are only a storage unit. That's right. It's got to be generated some way in, in the first place. No, I, I, 
those discussions are in fact happening. The, 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 the really underlying issue is there are too many people on the planet <laughs> and we, we have very high standards okay. of comfort. You, you and you, I don't know. Well, no, no <laughs> but, but you know, limiting how many more kids we have. And that's an area that people don't want to get into. Uh, so the, what we're looking at is what do we do with the world as we find it? And that's for many people, certainly for me, uh, getting into politics, having once been the young man who nobly voted for Doc, Mr. Spock, Dr. Spock for president, getting into the idea, if, if I'm going to do anything useful here, I'm going to get involved politically, automatically you make a change. You're saying, I'm going to deal with the world as I find it. And it, you need a taste for very imperfect legislation. And this, this is highly imperfect. It is. But it is highly, it, it is addressing a, a, a crisis that we face, yeah, just, and we face it with our economy. I mean, the global warming is going to decimate Vermont's economy as it is at the moment. Our, our forest industries are going to be affected, our mapling, our agriculture, our tourism. It's already having a huge impact, as we know, on our ski industry and on the invasive bugs that are able to come here and thrive. I mean. We people have ignored for too long the impacts of our burning fossil fuels, and we need to rein it in. And it's going to be a costly transition, there's no question. But we've had a hundred years of living and burning fossil fuels uh, in a sort of completely thoughtless way. And for many of those years, our major corporations and scientists have known the impact that was coming our way, and some of them did nothing about it. And some of them, as Bill McKibben has been, our own Vermont's Bill McKibben has been a prophet crying in the wilderness. And finally, we're beginning to see the effects. And finally, we're beginning to, you know, people are, 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 are beginning to be really worried. And you're right, Dave, this is not, this is the best we can do at the moment to transition in a thoughtful, affordable way. I would argue with you, this is designed to make it more affordable for Vermonters long term. I just got the $930 fuel bill. I mean, for a bill that would normally be about $500. It's, it's, uh, it, it, Vermonters cannot afford the fuel they're using now. And I live in a Hummer. I live in a, you know, a 19th century house that has never been weatherized. Uh, and, and I've got, and there's lots of help and we're designing lots of help. This is the best and most thoughtful way we are working on now to transition Vermonters to a cleaner heat standard. That's what we're doing. And it's going to need tinkering along the way, just like everything we do. We're only there for four and a half months. That's why we have the Vermont Climate Council that's there full time. This is their recommendation. We've worked on it. We've improved it. Uh, it's coming. It, 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 so I, I think this is the best work at the moment that we can do to help thoughtfully and affordably transition Vermonters off a fuel source that's killing us and killing our planet. So I think that's where we are, and I think we're trying to do the best job we can do. There are huge trade-offs in the equation of trying to actually reduce global warming, not just in Vermont, but the whole world, because there are, you have to look at the equation of how much greenhouse gases are released in the extraction of natural resources mm -hmm. to make the batteries or in making the biofuels, you're creating palm oil plantations somewhere else in the world. Um, so we can, we can do things that make us feel good because we can look around us and say, yes, now we're using less fossil fuels here in Vermont, but what's the trade-off somewhere else in the country or in the world or even somewhere else in the state? Um, so, um, you know, I'm not saying I have the answers, but I can understand what he's saying and um, what, what people at, you know, uh, 350 Vermont are saying, too. Um, we could be making things a lot harder for people on another continent. Um, and, you know, and it's fine because it's out of sight. We don't see it, but it's, it's still affecting them as we as we do our transition um so that has to be taken into account to some degree of course just, yeah well it is i can i can assure but coming down on a final decision that is not exactly what 
everyone wants does not mean we're not we didn't take it into account uh, it, well, the proposition is being made to me and I'm not sure I buy it that there is that this we cannot get off petroleum without reliance on some biofuels that that's part take that out and you don't have an alternative Okay, take take the biofuels out of the of the equation, and the the right wing guys are saying, "Well, everyone's going to freeze in the dark." Uh, what actually happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, that that is everybody freezing in the dark. I, that you I need agree. some kind of energy. I agree with you because you know I have a wood stove, and I'm you know I'm I'm making the transition. I've got a heat pump or whatever, but yeah. there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to heat my house without some wood. Yeah, but I've and reduced, that would be your I've reduced my wood. You but your your the presence of your wood stove and several cords in the in the shed expedites the use of the pump of the heat pump. That's the theory. Right. As I say, it's coming. I mean, we're 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 hoping to to actually we're doing markup. It's called markup. We actually start changing the words and make, giving, getting the final version and then voting on it. Where the, the chair of Natural Resources wants to vote it out this week, wants us to complete markup this week. So I, when, I, when I say I've, I'm articulating the argument that's been made and I say I, I'm not convinced, I, I'm going to have to make a decision this week as to whether I vote for this bill or not. You know, I, you, you were talking about... Uh, Allison was talking about the, the forest the pride, um, industry is going to be hurt if we do if we don't do something. Well, it's just one of the industries impacted by global okay. warming. Okay, all right. Now I I own thirty acres of land. I heat my house with wood. The wood comes off my property. I have I'm I'm in current use. I had a forester come look at my property when we started. He came for his ten year inspection. He says, "Oh my God, you've improved this land so much. That's great. What have you done?" I've taken the wood out to keep myself warm. I've taken the proper wood out. So I've improved my forest land with heating my home. So if it was done well, obviously my yeah. forester thinks I've done a good job, maybe we can, we can uh, improve the forestry industry. The trouble is that the global warming also has brought in uh, various invasive species that undermine forest health, insect species, plant species as well. And there are um, certain species of trees that are suited to particular environments, and as the environment changes, they find themselves essentially exiled. I mean, you know, you just drive north in Vermont, and you see fewer hardwoods the further north you get, and more conifers. That's just because they're suited to that. Now, as as the warm weather moves up, uh, you know, some of it, it might get a little warm for some of those conifers, and it takes a long time. It's not as though I mean, maybe critters can do that. I mean, we're we never you never had a, a, a I never saw an opossum in Vermont. And now you have them all the time. So they, they can just, well, it's getting kind of warm here. Let's move up to Vermont. The trees don't do that. That takes decades. And uh, I've been on this property for decades. Yeah. And we've logged several times. And that's my, my forester telling you that's kind of natural progression. You log maple, chances are maple's not going to come back. You might come back with a a beech or a birch or something like that, and then it's as the that grows, evolution and as that um, grows, then you might have hemlock and spruce yeah. come in, and as you log that, the maple might come back. So there is a, a rotation, be, say it, for over a longer period of time, which I, I'm 68 years old, I've been on this property for 63. So I've seen this happen. So yeah. people tell me that I'm not, dis I'm not saying you're wrong. What I would like to, what I'm trying to say is there's another idea of what's happening. Yeah, no, no, for, uh, forests do evolve. They, they do mature and, and, and they go through to the next chapter. But uh, all I'm saying is that there's, that whatever the, uh, the bio arrangement is, 
it's specific to a particular to the climate it's in, and as the climate is changing, it means that the environment is less suitable towards there, and we're and we really are seeing that. I mean, that's uh, there's new stressors. Yeah. New stressors. yeah. Who knows what the future. I mean, I think the moose, uh, the decimation of the, the moose. Uh, like the ticks. Yeah, it's because uh, the, the winters are mm -hmm. shorter and that's good cold. for the ticks. So you got more healthy, strong, aggressive ticks. Well, also, I mean, there's all kinds of issues now with, with global warming and, and uh, forest management that we never even thought about 50 years ago because now we in the Northeast have this huge carbon sink called yeah. the Northeast Deciduous Forest. Mm -hmm. And we have to start now looking at that as a resource, not just for sustainable harvesting of wood for fire, wood and logging, and everything else. We got to have those forest products. We can't do without them. But at the same time, we need to be using those forest blocks to get rid of the carbon that's in the air. Yeah. It's, it's the best resource we have, the cheapest. Yeah. Absolute cheapest way we have a whole new appreciation for how our forests work yeah. for us. Yeah. Yeah. For how do you, I'm not showing what I've done, what and I'm doing and just that, that. Oh yeah, that crappy old pine oh. that we took yeah. out. I got nothing for it, but I've got deciduous trees coming back. Well-managed yeah. forests are yeah. incredibly important to this state and to the future of this world. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question, and that's why I think we can't begin to look at, at prohibiting biofuels because too many people, I mean, you know, lots of people heat by wood. And uh, we can make wood cleaner, we can make better filters, we can do all sorts of things to improve the way we burn wood. And we have in the last 20 years, I mean, they're, but it is an essential part of the, of, of, of heating our homes, particularly here in the Northeast. Dick knows where I stand as a member of 350 Vermont. But I want to defend S5 on one thing, <clears throat> and that is that the use of those biofuels involves uh, a serious look at not just the amount of carbon that is produced when that fuel is burned, but on the production, mm -hmm. the transportation, all of the uh, inputs that go into it. Uh, you were, Dave, so you were talking about that diesel, that diesel, that diesel. All of those things are factored in to the, uh, the amount of credit that a particular biofuel will receive. And, and so I, that, that particular piece, and I don't think it's complete, because uh, there are other things that it doesn't include, but I but I think I want to give credit to thinking about all of the pieces that go into calculating the quote value of a particular biofuel. Uh, that's uh, that's important. Uh, my con my concern and and Dick knows this is that it does not allow for consideration of the people who live in or near the production of that fuel uh, and whether or not they are being, you know, the child labor. No, the equity. Uh, it, it, there's an equity piece that uh, some have argued <coughs> Public Utilities Commission, for example, that's outside of Vermont. We don't have any jurisdiction. We can't do anything. My argument is, oh yes, we can. We can decide how much it value, the value of that carbon, of that unit of, of fuel is for Vermonters. And we can apply a reasonable standard that says, no, this is coming off of indigenous land, that, et cetera, et cetera. But that has, those are all things that are under consideration. Uh, and, no, and I'm okay with that, uh, and I understand that. I don't ever hear anybody talking about the, uh, you're going to replace that diesel skitter with this humongous diesel loader who's digging up the earth. Well, that diesel skitter 
is going out and retrieving and using renewable sources. That lithium, uh, you're not, I seriously doubt you're ever going to see any new lithium or cobalt. Once we deplete that, it's gone. So I, I agree with the, the oh. fact about the oil thing. But when you start getting into uh, biofuels managed correctly, which I, I'm, a, I'm for biofuels, managed correctly, that, that is an endless supply. Right. Now, of course, the thing is that biofuels do contribute carbon to the, to the atmosphere. Maybe less, some of them less, but they do contribute carbon. And that's. Yeah, we have wood chip plants that create electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Montpelier is very dependent. Dave, no one had, no one has said. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're trying to man if I can, well, we're trying to manage a very, very imperfect situation. No one has said this bill is perfect because I guess, I guess I'd like to see. Uh, you know, I could see that bill being 150 pages. What? Not that I want to. Hey, it may be by the time it makes it through the legislature. <laughs> There's so many things that I'm talking about that I didn't see uh, talked about in the bill. That's part. That's part of this picture. They're often they're in there implicitly in that in that much of this has to do with process for developing the pro the program further. A lot's being handed off to the Public Utilities Commission. I, I think Scott wanted to. Well, I in relation rather than argue about the details of stuff, I'd like to talk about education. If we educate our young people, then they're the ones that are going to actually have to implement what we're all here talking about. And I disagree mm. with with uh, um, Dick about too many people. I don't think we have too many. We have too many old people, and we need to put our time and effort into the young people. And I think schools are the place to do it. Yeah. And um, I'd like to learn more about our school system. Our school system seems to be a catch-all for feeding kids, um, mental mm -hmm. health, all of those sort of things, and we don't seem to be be funding that, and the funding ends up in the small towns. I did see an article about um, um, helping changing the CLA so that schools that have a higher poverty level will get a little bit uh, more. I'd like to talk. That's the waiting. That's the waiting study. The waiting study so last year. Yeah. The, those type of things. Again, I think Education is the key to answering all of these questions sooner or later, and I think we aren't putting as much effort into that. And again, we seem to be, our schools are now in charge of, of, of mental health. Um, the whole nine yards, we throw that in there, and then we don't fund that. But we need to educate our people, whether it's about money, whether it's about civics, all of these sort of things, we're fighting about things that, whatever, we need to be working on educating our young people so they're the ones that are going to have to implement these. And these are the people that are going to be affected by what we do. A a absolutely. And none of us serve on education. But I would say that there are many education issues that are top, uh, 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 top priorities in the legislature this year. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, universal meals, mental health. I mean, this is where kids spend the vast majority of their time and teachers. So remember, it's a school community. It's not just the kids. And uh, for a host of reasons, um, mental health is a huge issue that, that, that our teachers and our students are all, all suffering from real challenges to their, to their mental health. And how we fund that is a question mark. It's not being well funded at the moment. Uh, universal meals is something that we're looking at uh, and figuring out how to fund it is a big question but there is no question the data shows that if kids eat better uh, all kids no matter what their income if kids eat better they perform better they they are pay better attention and they do better work uh, reducing the stigma in the lunch line about who pays and who doesn't pay that's a piece of it and I bet we're bright we can figure that out the biggest issue I think that we're going to face this year is actually uh, directly related to the Supreme Court decision this summer about Maine, the Macon decision. And that is going to call into question tuition and the equity issue between towns that uh, tuition and towns that don't. 
and how we are going to protect our public schools, quite frankly. Uh, because right now, uh, the Macon decision says that all our public dollars could go to religious parochial schools. And how the legislature deals with that is, I think, going to be one thing you're really going to look at, want to look at. Yes, we're going to look at the CLA and try and figure out the impact of all these houses selling at, at much too high prices. And, you know, we'll figure, we'll figure that out. But I think the make a decision is going to be the thorniest thing we deal with this year. Uh, and in, actually maybe in the next two years. Uh, because it is an equity issue. Uh, it is uh, a, uh, a, 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 public, uh, a, a public resource and, and a public priority and a huge public value. Uh, the foundation of our democracy in many ways is based on access to education and and providing an equitable and uh, and hopefully terrific education for our 20 as you say for our next generation so I think this is going to be actually one of the thorniest things we deal with this year is is what we do about public dollars and whether it stays in public schools or whether it continues to go out into tuition all over the place so I think that's, you know, Dick and, and Kirk may have some thoughts on this, but it's, I think this is going to be our biggest challenge this year. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm here is probably you know when you saw me coming in. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dick for the advisors and help to provide me over the last eight years. Uh, and you, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Kirk. Kirk. <laughs> uh, about nursing. Yeah. Yes. Heidi is in a nursing home for the last eight months. Wonderful place. But I see it every day that I go there, new faces, shortage on help. Yeah. So I did my own little research, talked to about 12 LNAs and nurses down there. You know what my number one answer to them was when I asked them, I showed them the thing you sent me, uh, Kurt. Yeah. These people ought to know more. They should come and see what we, how we spend our days in here working. Mm. Uh, and they meant it. And, and they don't cut any effort from their work to take care of the patients or residents down there. But they all emphasize, do they come and see what it takes to take care of a, a person? No. <clears throat> I, I I would disagree with that. I I know that the, that the House the House Health Care Committee went and visited uh, uh, care facilities last year uh, as they were doing the workforce bill. As they were as they were doing their part of the workforce bill, they actually did. They obviously didn't visit all of them in the state, but they did visit. They, but <clears throat> the point they were trying to make is there's a lot more than visit a place and yeah look around. Oh, this nurse has extra hair hanging out of their head, uh, see what they are doing 24-7, you know, and this is what, they, and they are all professional, they do not want to deny any care to the people there, and I see that the care Heidi is receiving where she is. Uh, How is the care, Nick? Fantastic. Where and she where, is. Where, where is she? Cedar Hill. Okay. Mm. Right. You know. Yeah. And they are very short of help. Yes. Right. They have a couple of Congolese nurses, and they are the happiest to work in there because they keep, keep on telling me, my goodness, are you giving all these things to the people here? It's back uh, in our country, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. So that's one. And the other thing, when you sent me the paper, uh, Kirk, um, we also gave the net, all the nursing schools and programs money to... Uh, expand their programs to feed more students. And I asked many of them there, I said, do you know anything about these things? They had no freaking clue what's going on. How do you make people know, mm -hmm. okay, we passed the, yeah. this rule or whatever. This opportunity, how do they know yeah. about those opportunities? Exactly, that's the word. So the, the word there is outreach, and you hear the word okay. outreach a what lot is? on not on this, but on a lot of different issues. Uh, my wife Cindy is very active in the the food shelf, you know, and and, and they started doing outreach with just with the suspicion, the the seat of the pants suspicion that there were people with food problems in Bethel who they didn't know about, 
and who yeah. did not know about the food shelf and just outreach and it's like on the one hand I'm, I, I'm not happy that there are so many more people going to the food shelf but those people probably needed it when they weren't going and it's just that kind of and same thing with with uh, nursing home staff pretty much anything we make a, a, a limit on the use of force by the police I'm not sure that we do a good enough job of making sure the police know now what you can't do that anymore. <laughs> well, I, this is helpful because we're revisiting, we're doing workforce uh, this yeah. year. It's one of our top priorities. And we need to find out of the, of the opportunities we passed, who, yeah, uh, how, do people, how do people know about them? Who's taking advantage of them? There, um, we have expanded the opportunity for tuition reimbursement, for scholarship money, for uh, more career and technical education opportunities, you know, so for you know, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth graders to get into LNA and, and into nursing. So we have provided a lot of opportunities. How are we doing on that? That's a you're, it's a good reminder to, to us as we go into this. And how are how are kids knowing about it? Hopefully, kids who are interested are being encouraged at at, at high school and in their middle school to start thinking about these career opportunities. Mm -hmm. And um, and hopefully the schools that are, uh, I know that the Vermont Technical uh, College, VTC, and CCV are doing a, quite a bit of outreach into the community about mm -hmm. these opportunities. So I, <clears throat> but it's a good, Reminder for us to check and say, okay, you know, we pass these great opportunities and we put a ton of money into them. Well, where is the money gone? What are the gone? numbers like? Who's yeah. taking yeah. advantage of where them? Where is How the are... money gone and what are the results? Of yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and we will be asking those questions as yeah. we take up the workforce bill. So thank you. That's a good <laughs> and reminder. Another thing that they said, I kept on saying that okay. 50 years ago to myself. What if you end up in a nursing home? What if you do the same thing? What would you expect to receive when you're down there? Think of that. Mm -hmm. Make a visit to any nursing home, not Cedar Hill. Don't make any announcement, I'm coming in, you know, play the band and everything. Right. <laughs> no one's there playing a band for us. Yeah. <laughs> Just well, to lunch it. Yeah. You know. So. I wish. There's a lot, a <laughs> lot more. Like Housing. And you you want to bring more nurses here? No. Where are you going to yes, put them? Yes. Where are we going to put them? Yeah. Well, UVM, as you may or may not know, is building a whole a whole new piece of housing. DHMC is building more housing. Mount Escutney is thinking about it. UVM they, could be another state, you know. No, <laughs> but DHMC is is doing is is, is definitely there. Excuse me. Thanks, Francis. Goodbye. Good to see you, Ellie. So, so it, it is it is a huge problem. Yep. Yeah. And they all are but, in, interrelated. And whatever we discuss here this morning is absolutely nothing wrong, to my opinion. But housing, nursing, yeah. And you hear on TV the nursing, nurses are the front line. Nurses and doctors. I mean, we need exactly. both. Exactly. And we need so, housing for them because we have know. had too many come, and then they can't find housing, so they don't take the jobs. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I mean, a, you see it everywhere, huge, you know. And yeah. then on the other hand. You need so many permits to build, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. Yeah, we're working on that. We're working on that. How, how much longer? Um, hopefully you'll see something by crossover uh, on what at least the Senate is proposing on that. Yeah, early March. So, I crossover. Mean, that, that would be a huge improvement in the province yeah. we are. Yeah. We okay. don't disagree. So, so. Just a plug so. for this area, though. We do the uh, RTCC in Randolph. Uh, which our South Royalton kids, yeah. uh, our South Royalton Bethel kids go to, have been, I think it was about five or six years ago, have instituted, and they actually have a fairly good LNA program. They have a terrific LNA program. Which is program. tied to the VTC program, yeah. so the kids can, can leave the high school environment, go to the uh, technical center, and then if they true, like it, they can just go up the road right. six yeah. miles and and dual they enrollment go. helps them feel comfortable at, at, at the college. And, I mean, and we, I, we have, yeah. we're talking about education, this is a beautiful, we have a mm -hmm. great okay. place for, for nursing. Yeah, I Opportunity. Agree. I agree. And one education. of the barriers had been uh, nurse, uh, the people who taught nurses, because yeah. we didn't have enough nurse educators, because it was not, a, it wasn't financially rewarding enough for them to leave yeah. nursing profession and actually come and teach. 
And so we've also addressed that and, um, and you know, spent more money uh, helping finance nurse, uh, the teachers who are leaving, you know, taking a break from nursing and coming to teach nursing. So, you know, we're, we're addressing that. We, we're clear on those barriers and we just need to keep helping finance this until we can get a more stable workforce so that Heidi can be taken care of. And Dave, I want to, it's very yeah, gratifying to... Yeah, you can imagine over there. There's no question. I, but give them a little help. Yeah, yeah. we're working. Yeah. We are trying. Yeah. It's just like you guys being up there in Montpelier and you stay there 24 hours a day, no breaks, <laughs> and do the best you can. We, we're, how we long, are. How, we're much, how long can. do you last up there? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about 32 years. No, no, no. I mean, working 24 7. What's that? 24 7. No breaks. Oh, oh, you're comparing it to nursing. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So no, see, no. see how I, you feel. I got or, you. I'm not saying you personally. I know. I know. Yeah. Dave, I, I want to say how it's gratifying to hear you speak well of dual enrollment. That 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 was the work that was the work of the education committee when I chaired it, and it's it's nice to get a little feedback about something. Well, I, I had experience. I was. Uh, Thank you. I was on the board for 13 years, chair for two. Yeah. And when that was really coming around, it's like, why not? Yeah, I, yeah, that was the thing. Is right. why not? Right. The, the the other thing is is the uh, the importance of the trades. Yeah. I'm I'm one of three brothers and one sister, and of the four of us, one of my brothers and my sister and I are all college graduates. One brother just was not a student. He was bright, but he was not a student, and he became interestingly an electrician, and at one time or another. Each of my brother's college-educated siblings has gone to him for a loan. <laughs> and he's well-read. The, the other part, because they always say, a college, education is not just for the purpose of, of, of earning a lot of money. It's supposedly you become an educated person. My brother is a very educated person. He's self-taught has occasionally a surprising gap in his knowledge because no one was guiding him. But he is well-read, well-traveled, and uh, a sophisticated intellect. And basically dropped out of eighth grade. And one more thing about Kirk. I really like when you did reporting. That's what we're doing, that, you know, make your views known to your towns and everything. That means a lot. Well, that's true. I'm sure it means a lot to me. I don't know how many others are uh, like that, but uh, and whatever I said about you, and you are still standing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be standing, I'll be, I'll be sticking to that. Yeah, these, <laughs> these, these what Kurt's doing is it gives uh, me a choice to. Uh, do I want to know what he's doing? I know where I can go and find out. Yeah. Um, I don't have time to go to Montpelier. I may, I'm trying to get retired. I might have later, but through my career, I didn't have time to go to Montpelier and listen and set, you know, you got a one o'clock testimony time. Well, well, I'm kind of busy making money so I can right. live yeah. at one o'clock. So yeah, I can read the, the letters and the info and um, I've gone to this, for a lot of what's yeah. going on up there. That's why I have, you know, I've only got half of what I was going to talk to you about, but uh, at least I can be, I was, I was surprised at some of the things I read. I mean, unfortunately, I'm looking for failures because I want to stop that. I mean, just quickly, some of the things that there's in S, S4, uh, they want to pass a bill that's already in a law. Why? Why what is, is that? that? Why are you that? wasting ink? <laughs> what? It's il it's illegal to uh, uh, buy a gun for a felon. You want to put that in a bill? That's already a that's already law. Well, it's in a draft at this no, point. Yeah, but, it, uh, but, okay. but why is it even there? It's, it is a law. Uh, Enforce the law, and you don't have to make another law. Right, and that would that will come out in the committee process. That's what you will get testimony. I mean, the the, the draft is is is. We are a citizen legislature. We hire lawyers to actually do the drafting. Although I have written a couple of my own bills over the years. You see a bill, you know, introduced by Senator McCormick. I, I wrote the bill in the vernacular and gave it to the drafts person and said, you know, write, write me up a bill that does this. 
and um, the drafts person with a ton of drafting requests uh, may well have made a mistake. That's why we have a committee process. Yeah, but it's, it's and, in there like six places. Well, it's like, come on. Or maybe there's maybe there's some difference between the present law and what's being achieved there. I don't. I'm not from. The, I'm the, I haven't dealt with that bill. I'm not on the committee of jurisdiction, so I, I can't speak to the particulars. But but in, in general, I mean, it, this the process is one of refining and looking for things that probably shouldn't be there, and then we and take them out. more comment that I'm going to make, my wife said, we could not do this, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so I have a thing about, uh, I have recently decided that I dislike, I was going to say hate, but no, I dislike all politicians. <laughs> because, because all politicians are supposed to be my representative. Yeah. And maybe not you two or may fall outside that, but there's an awful lot of politicians out there who are self serving. I, you know, you, you can agree or disagree. And my wife said, don't say that, but I said it anyway. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, we had several people choose not to run for re-election in this last election because they just said, I can't afford to keep being in the legislature. There's better money to be made pretty much in any place else. It's, you know, this is, I find the work first, yeah, I don't, I, I get suspicious any time anyone says something that even hints at altruism, but I really do want to serve. I want to make a better world. Also, for my selfish reasons, I find the work interesting. It's very, very interesting. And selfishly, I like to be engaged in something that really bites my mind. I do not do this for the money. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I self-serving, but it had nothing to do with money. It has to do, in my opinion, it has to do with I'm a very powerful person. I can, I can do things and make things happen that you can't. Well... Again, Vermont, with its 660,000 people uh, and its little legislature, I, I don't. I think anyone in the Vermont legislature who who thinks they're powerful is fooling themselves. It's a very small level of power. Okay, well, I, okay I it really I'm is. Shut my mouth. There. No, no, you don't. No. If I don't speak my mind. But also, you know, people will talk about that we're representatives. And someone will say, if 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 you if I disagree with something you're doing, then you're not representing me. Yeah. And and doesn't work that way. Well, I represent the people of Windsor County, and they speak with many different voices. Agreed. They speak with contradictory voices. Agreed. Okay. Great. But that that was part of what I had the problem with. That's four was the, the fact that there was all about you know, children and, and protecting children and stuff like yeah. that. I'm sorry to yeah. keep going on, but hey, I'm I'm what just kind of retired, so I got a few extra minutes. We have another appointment to get <laughs> okay. to. I'm going to the long day and sit around. Well, I'm just yeah. not quite there yet. But you know, the, electronically, we're well connected. You know, they, but you're in this in S4. You're talking about protection of children and and stuff like that a lot. And then in the then you then you throw in some firearm stuff, and I'm thinking. Okay, let's talk about children. Let's let's not put something else in there that, and maybe there's a couple things in there that have, uh, 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 go with children. But the fact that you're not going to allow anybody to sell a hand any gun that has a threaded barrel so they can put on a suppressor. I mean that's, and then you talk you 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 talk specifically about suppressors and silencers. Tell me the difference. Do you know the difference between a suppressor and a silencer? Me? Yeah. No. I don't think anybody don't that wrote that had any idea because there's pretty much that much difference between a suppressor yeah. and a silencer because there's no such thing as a silencer. It is a suppressor. It, cre it, it reduces the sound it creates, but it doesn't silence. Okay, I mean, the, those are the kinds of insights that, that would come out in the legislative process. Anyway, you know, when we we sorry, make we make the news. A legislator makes the news when he gets up in in, in the chamber and waxes eloquent. 
That's not usually what happens. Most of, when I say most of our time, I mean 95% of our time is spent in a committee rooms, you know, going over the texts of bills or taking testimony. Mainly what we do is, is listen to people to give testimony. And what you just said is the kind of testimony that bill will likely get from someone. Yep. I, I think this thing goes to what? No, I, it went. Yeah. It went. Uh, okay. and, and, and we no. had talked about how much, how prosperous being a legislator is, which is why <laughs> I have to go at, to my day job now. Uh, so, uh, uh, but. Thank, uh, you. Thank you for indulging me. Yeah. But, if, but if Dick wants to talk to you, I'll uh, around for another cup of coffee. Two minutes. If I could, I just want to say one thing. I, sorry. I'm very sorry. sorry. I had no idea Ellie was going to speak. As she did. I figured that and um, I felt for you. <laughs> so, well, and I'm sorry. My daughter is overworked at a place that cannot find people because they cannot find childcare. That's also that's an a, issue. That's just, a, I'm just going to say that. That's another one of those impediments yeah. uh, to we'll finding and growing the workforce. Yeah. Has well, Allison left? Yeah. Come back next yeah. month. Okay. We'll talk about child care. Also, Allison yeah. is the vice chair of, of the Economic Development Committee, so we'll which has and she and she serves on yeah. the Government yeah. Operations yeah. Committee, yeah. and those yeah. are the two yeah. committees yeah. that are doing yeah. child care. We have a child care yeah. bill, yeah. Yeah. and is. Uh, yeah. so, uh, but I just I just want to throw that yeah. Yeah. to the pile of yeah. insolvable problems. Yeah. 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 You're facing one of the saving graces for Gifford moving. If they have a good education job. down the ladder, age wise. Yes, yes. So that which which uh, could be double edged sword in that okay, okay, now we got three and four year olds in our education system, so they now don't need, no longer we need uh, child care for those three and four year olds. It, it's um, gonna undermine the child the private child care center. Unfortunately. That issue has come up. That's part of the, the um, discussion. I have a right grandson, now. ten years old. He and I were talking about shit that I didn't see until I was a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. So something's going right. I mean, this, he, he goes to school in Randolph, and he's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, where does that come in from? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about just an intellectual sophistication. Yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's kind of just kind of on that subject of child care. Um, I sub over to school, and Friday was an early release so the teachers could do their thing. Yeah. It was probably, I don't know the number, but there was an awful lot of kids missing because... The, what are the, where are the kids going to do with the half day? They've got it scheduled so when the kids are in school, they can work and do all that and work their schedule. But in the half day, now they've either got to take the whole day off from school, work, yeah. or, or take the kid to grandma's or whatever. Yeah. So there's actually kids are losing school time because of a half day school. Yeah. Our, our system was, was, of course, created when you always had one parent, usually the, the mother, was home. And so you had a half day. Yeah. The kids had some place to go. And, and our I, society is no longer we're, that. We're dealing with unions, and I realize that teachers need more training. I understand all of that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But bottom line is we need to, to focus on our schools. That's the answer. And again, chi chi <clears throat> a lot of child care is going on to the schools. We've got third grade or three yeah. year olds in school now. Um, yeah. That's another whole level expense, a whole lot of more people with more education, and and it gets full not in the local towns and especially poor towns. Yeah. Um, it's tough. Yeah. And, you know, I, I help over at the school, and you know, these free meals are not free, say nothing about, you know, where the money comes from the state, the amount of time it takes to get the paperwork to the state to get reimbursed for the money it's it's a mind-boggling conundrum. I think that. Actually, I don't. I don't, I don't want to make up an answer. I have to go. <laughs> Thank you, Kirk. Thank but you. Thank you. I, I, I think that in part is because a lot of that is federal money. But I'm yeah. not. I'm well, not I understand that's federal money, but yeah, just well, the paperwork <laughs> to separate what's federal money, what's state's okay. money, and people aren't. Yeah. People aren't. Um, Putting in, applying for free and reduced because they're all getting free anyway, so it skews the, the numbers of which ones qualify. I mean, the school, in order to get 
reduced internet. You, ha you have to go to school if you're free and reduced meals. You can get reduced internet for, for your students. Again, it's another thing that the school secretary has got to keep track of all this stuff. So if yeah. somebody wants EC fiber, they've got to go to the school and find out if they qualify for the free and reduced meals to see if they qualify for the... Again, the government is notoriously bureaucratic. It drives you crazy. Part, I think the one excuse is, is to say it's not the government's money. It's the people's money, right. and they're entitled to an accounting. <laughs> and it gets crazy but and frustrating. But. We need less old people and more young people. That's what I say. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I agree with that statement. <laughs>